Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. A uh, paper just came out uh, yesterday talking about uh, some repeated surveys that have been done in Canada's uh, Beaufort Sea. So side scan sonars have been measuring very accurately the bathymetry of the Beaufort in the Beaufort Sea area near the edge of the continental shelf. And this work has been going on between 2010 and 2019 in four different surveys of overlapping regions. And they've also been using remotely operated vehicles to film the seafloor and look for features in these surveys. What they've determined is that in that space of time, these enormous sinkholes or depressions have formed in the seafloor. The, for example, the image that I showed you uh, at the beginning of this video uh, is one of these sinkholes. It's 24 meters deep 220 meters long and 74 meters wide. So in feet, multiply those numbers by 3.3. So it's about 80 feet deep and about 230 feet wide and about 720 feet long. So this hole has formed in the seafloor in that region and you could fit in a city block basically of six-story buildings that's to give you an idea as to how massive this thing is and also in this in that region of the seafloor we've also seen these pingo like features appearing so pingos are basically conical hills if you like. Now on land we've seen both sinkholes occurring especially in the Yamal Peninsula in Siberia and in other regions um, and those have been caused by methane outbursts. So those are methane uh, explosions that have blown rock and debris uh, out of the depression and these are believed to be occurring because of the buildup of the methane as we get uh, more and more warming on the surface and that warming penetrates down and thaws out the permafrost, allows for, you know, releases methane and then it blows out the sinkhole. We've also, we also have loads of pingos on the land where you have basically a lens of ice forming so it's like frost heaving if you like and it creates a a um, little hill if you like so we're seeing that type of feature also on the seafloor in this region so i'm going to go into detail on the peer-reviewed paper you know and examine these uh, features that have been measured for the first time on the seafloor. Now, if you'll recall, um, it's been a number of years ago now when I talked about huge craters on the seafloor um, down near New Zealand. And some people have attributed those to huge bursts of, of uh, methane being, being released from those regions creating uh you know creating abrupt climate transitions in the in the paleo records in the past so you know this uh type of feature that has just been measured in the Beaufort Sea I'm extremely interested in to see if this is the methane clathrate gun kind of going off if you like so um I'll get right to the uh details um uh without uh any more preamble okay so 
this image here is one of these uh, one of these uh, structures that now don't forget that this is a repeated type of survey um, that's done on four different occasions between 2010 and 2019. So these features are appearing. These are, are new features. And this isn't even the largest of them here. Okay, so let's uh, start at the beginning. Okay, so this is the article that just appeared, just appeared yesterday. Holes the size of city blocks are forming in the Arctic seafloor. Um, first of all, I'll go back to Twitter. Follow my Twitter account if you can, if you're not already following it. And if you haven't, if you're not in Twitter, I highly recommend that you join Twitter and follow my account and I'll follow you back. Okay, so I posted a couple things on methane, on the rise of methane. Methane being released from both microbial and thermogenic sources. This is an ex existential crisis, a PNAS article. Um, Leonard Yurganov, if you follow methane and you follow my videos, you probably, the name is familiar probably. It's, it's a, a Russian scientist. Um, and he says, from my computer, methane anomaly in moderate latitudes of the northern hemisphere for zero to four kilometers of elevation measured by two um, instru instruments on satellites. The cause of the observed acceleration remains unknown. And here we have the methane curve. This is methane, this is a zonal mean. So if basically it's averaged um, over the zones, zonal mean is the average with uh, longitude around the earth. Okay, and this is from 45 to 9, 60 degrees north. So this isn't in the high Arctic, but this just shows you that what's going on here, you know, there's year to year fluctuation, but look at the explosion. It went up and it's continued to climb. This is very, very concerning. I did a video very recently uh, from the satellite data showing you how much methane has increased in the last year. And the increase in the last year basically is equivalent to the increase in the previous 13 years. So I showed this um, in an extensive video on methane um, that I did uh, within the last month. You know, maybe it was two, three weeks ago. Um, so this is very concerning. Um, and then this was retweeted. This anomaly is a result of combined thermogenic, so heat causing thawing of permafrost. The organic matter decomposes in the absence of oxygen if it's not at the surface, producing methane. Microbes uh, breaking down um, matter, uh, forming methane. This year will be exponentially worth worse as the ongoing deep thaw of permafrost releases even more methane. Expect weather to deviate even more from the Holocene. So methane is becoming a huge problem to our climate. It's greatly contributing to abrupt climate change. Okay, um, now this is the article about the underwater sinkho sinkholes are occurring in the Arctic over short time scales of years. Very ominous, I put. So let's have a look at, at the article first. So holes the size of city blocks are forming in the Arctic seafloor. So first of all, we have a picture here. What you see here is a side scan sonar. It looks like a torpedo. It's lowered from the ship and it it's, it's, uh, hovers over the seafloor. The cable lowers it so it's, it's above the seafloor and it's sending a sonar beam this way. Um, and the ship is, of course, coming, uh, you know, it's towed behind the ship or underneath the ship. You know, th this is facing the motion of the ship. This is the back end. And it's sending a transverse beam and it's scanning the sea floor below to extremely high resolution. Once it sees images and objects, then this is a remotely operated vehicle or an autonomous underwater vehicle or underwater drone, if you like. Um, so they're using both of these things to map the seafloor. Okay, uh, before I continue with this article, 
This is a uh, side scan sonar, basically. So the ship is going this direction up. You're towing this side scan sonar. It's sending out a high frequency sonar beam, a, a conical beam here. And it's analyzing or picking up the, the scattered, the reflected signals and it's identifying. So this is what the scan might look like. So it's, it'll, it finds the boulder. It can identify the muddy region. Um, it can identify a depression in the ground, the sand, you know, gravel here, etc. cetera. Uh, it's used a lot for searching for ships, etc. And such a device was used to uh, find the um, Endurance, Shackleton ship, which I talked about extensively in, um, in um, my last video. Okay, so this is the side scan sonar. It sends conical or fan-shaped pulses down towards the seafloor across a wide angle perpendicular to the path of the sensor, sensor through the water, which may be towed by a surface vessel or submarine or mounted on the ship's hull. The intensity of the acoustic reflections from the seafloor, you know, sonar, it's like radar with sound, um, right? It records these slices, they're stitched together, and it gives an image of the sea bottom within the swath. Frequencies are uh, 100 to 500 kilohertz, quite high. Higher frequencies yield better resolution, but less range. So here's an image of a ship, uh, the Shipwreck Aid. Um, off Estonia, uh, as recorded with the side scan sonar. Very, very clear and great images. Here's an image of, of a bridge. Um, uh, this is another image of a freighter. Uh, you know, so it's great for finding wrecks on the seafloor. The remotely operated underwater vehicle, ROUV or just ROV, it's a tethered tethered to the ship, underwater mobile device, commonly called an underwater robot. You know, there's many, many different types. Okay, uh, you know, it's been around uh, since the 50s to retrieve torpedoes and mines. Um, and uh, basically there's different designs. Uh, and I'll give, there's a chart at the bottom. He, these are some images taken from an ROV of krill feeding on ice algae in Antarctica. So under the ice, uh, scientific ROV, it can have suction devices to capture specimens, et cetera. Um, these are scientific ROVs. So Jason, maybe the fam most famous one um, in Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. It's been operating from 88 on. And then uh, here, here's another one from the Woods Hole, goes down to 36,000 feet or 11,000 meters. Um, built, designed to explore the Challenger Deep. Um, here's another one, no image of it. Okay, so there's a lot of different types. Uh, you know, different ones. And, you know, the the one that scanned the Titanic, you know, very, very famous. Okay, so that's what the ROVs are. And Beaufort Sea is this region here, just north of Canada, frozen over most of the year. Historically, only a narrow pass up to 100 kilometers opened in August, September, but because of uh, Arctic uh, sea ice loss, it's open for longer and longer periods of time. Okay, um, so this is the, uh, you know, regions here, the Beaufort Sea, Chukki Sea. Okay, this is the topography. So the light blue areas, this is 100 uh, meters, this is in meters, 100 meters, 200 meters. So the light blue is all of the shallower water, and then the water gets deeper and deeper here within. Okay, so that's the region here. This is Alaska. This is the Yukon, Canada. We've got the Beaufort Sea up here. Okay, so let's go back to the article. So what happened? So marine scientists have discovered deep sinkholes, one larger than a city block of six-story buildings and ice-filled hills. So these are pingo-like uh, hills that have formed 
extraordinarily rapidly on a remote part of the Arctic seafloor. So they've mapped the uh, seafloor, Canada's Beaufort Sea, using the ROV and ship-mounted sonar, so side-scan sonar. And uh, the permafrost on the seafloor has been thawing, causing these slumps and these craters, and also causing pingos, where, where ice is frozen underneath and it drives up the, um, the ground. Okay, so these changes that have been measured have occurred between 2010 and 2019. Okay, there were four mapping surveys taken place covering an area of up to 10 square miles or 26 square kilometers. Okay, so this is one of the holes that developed here in less than 10 years. This is the first time that an area of submerged permafrost a frozen layer of Earth's surface has been surveyed in this way. It's not known how widespread similar changes are elsewhere in the Arctic, but we could assume wherever there's a continental shelf, tra shelf transition that this type of phenomena is occurring across the Arctic. There's no nothing unique about the Beaufort Sea. On land, therm thawing permafrost has led to radical shifts in the Arctic landscape, including ground collapses, the formation and disappearance of lakes, okay, the so-called thermokarst lakes. So you can get a slump of permafrost, you can get water pooling forming the lake, and then the water can find root, a route through the a fracture in the ground, etc., and the lake can just disappear. The emergence of mounds called pingos, this is mostly frost heaving, and then craters formed by blowouts of methane gas, okay, you're well aware of that, I've you know that's been um, happening and recorded for a number of years now. These extreme features have affected infrastructure such as roads and pipelines, and causing the so-called drunken trees and buildings collapsing. We know that big changes are happening across the Arctic landscape, but this is the first time we've been able to deploy technology to see that changes are happening offshore too. Okay, so these massive changes that we see up in the Arctic are not restricted just to the land. They're also happening in on the seafloor. The, the morphology, um, the depressions and hills and uh, cliffs, etc., it's all changing on the seafloor uh, pretty much in very, very rapidly in real time. It seems like much, much faster than what's happening on land. Okay, so this um, paper was just published on Monday, and I'll go through the scientific peer-reviewed paper in detail. Um, clearly, such large changes would have significant implications for any infrastructure that might be placed on the seafloor. But there's little infrastructure in this remote area of the Arctic. Um, however, this may change as continued warming makes the region more accessible. So, about one quarter of the land in the Northern Hemisphere is underlain by permafrost, including large areas under the sea. This is because at the end of the last ice age, around 12,000 years ago, the sea levels were 120 to 125 meters lower. So large areas of the continental shelf were above sea level back at that time. And with low air temperatures, the permafrost could form. And then as the sea level rose with the melting of the glaciers, it covered those, that, those, that permafrost. And that permafrost is still there. Um, lots of it is, but it's thawing rapidly, causing these slumps and pingos on the seafloor. So this, the region that they surveyed in the study, this, this study from 2010 to 2019, is a 10 square mile or 26 square kilometer area of study. So they mapped it in 2010. They mapped it again in 2019. Um, and they did it twice in between those years. But from 2010 to 2019, they found 41 steeply sided holes 
in the mo in the more recent mapping, so in 2019, that weren't there before. They weren't there in 2010. The holes were roughly circular or oval shaped. They averaged 22 feet deep or 6.7 meters deep. The biggest change was a depression, 95 feet or 29 meters deep, 738 feet or 225 meters long, and 312 feet or 95 meters wide. This is around the size of a city block made up of six-story buildings. So this is a massive, massive depression or hole that developed in the seafloor within that time frame, 2010 to 2019. There were also numerous hills or these pingo-like features. They're typically 164 feet high, which is 50, or, or 164 feet in diameter, which is 50 meters, and 33 feet or 10 meters high, and they contain ice. So it's like ice, the ice is forming underneath, driving up these, the creation of these hills. So they're similar to pingo. They're called pingo-like features, which are ice-filled mounds found on land. Surveys of smaller areas of the seafloor took place in 2013 and 2019, so they could look at, it, at um, changes in finer detail. So this is a mapping survey showing the water depth here. Uh, the shallower, you know, here's the water depth in meters. Um, the scale is obviously not right. You know, this is 205, this is 205 right? It's incorrect. You know, this will be shallower water, deeper water. You know, this should be like, I don't know, 100 meters or something. Um, okay, so they do, they repeat the survey. They found that the massive sinkhole developed in just over, uh, in over just nine years. So um, it's surprising to see changes like these occurring in such a short span of time. Permafrost degradation is usually a very slow process. We're talking about centimeters per year. This here is more than merely degradation. It's a qualitative change. It's a massive, abrupt change in a, in a short period of time within nine years. You just wouldn't see that. You wouldn't expect that on land. It's very unexpected to see. Okay, um... Hypotheses have been voiced in the literature concerning the possibility of such processes, but this is the first time they've been directly observed. And I've said on numerous occasions, I've said that, you know, why, why would we expect these arc changes in the Arctic, these features that are changing rapidly on land, not to extend into the ocean as well with the greatly warming ocean. Okay, so... Now, massive craters have been discovered in parts of the Russian Arctic, like the Yamal Peninsula, et cetera. They formed when the buildup of pockets of methane gas in the ground exploded, sending rock debris out and creating a huge crater. But the Beaufort Sea researchers, they ruled out a similar origin for the marine sinkholes that they discovered. They didn't find rocks and earth on the seafloor that would have been scattered. But of course, the water is much more viscous in the air. Any explosions would not have sent debris that far, maybe not even out of the hole. So I'm a bit skeptical that they can rule out this origin. Uh, but brackish or, or slightly salty water near the seafloor suggests the seawater was mixed with groundwater which would have been fresher, and the submarine permafrost wasn't a sealed system where overpressure could build up. So it looks like it's probably a different process. They didn't detect significant amounts of methane in the leaking groundwater, but they didn't, you know, they didn't, um, they, they weren't equipped, I think, to measure so much uh, of the methane. So they did some measurements of methane, but that wasn't the focus of their study. Uh, but they don't have evidence that the rapid changes in this area are associated with explosive events. So, of course, climate change is written all over this. Many of the landscape changes seen on the land on terrestrial permafrost have been attributed to warmer temperatures as a result of the climate crisis. The Arctic is warming four to five times faster than the global average. They still say get this wrong. You know, this is absurd that they're reporting it like this. 
However, the authors say the changes they've identified could not be explained by human-caused climate change. Okay, well, uh, you know, that's kind of, anyway, it's, uh, you know, I'm very skeptical that they're saying that. Since this is the first study of the decay of submerged permafrost, we don't have long-term data for the seafloor temperature in the region. The data they do have aren't showing a warming trend in these waters 150 feet, almost 100, 500 feet deep. So, you know, that that's what, but we do know that the, the um, mixing of the ocean, the vertical mixing is changing. We know that the ocean is heating uh, much faster at the surface and at depth. So, you know, this is the first study to look at this. So I would take these sort of statements with a grain of salt. Um, and then they say, I'm a bit confused here because they say the holes were likely caused by much older, slower climatic shifts that are related to the emergence from the last ice age and appear to be happening for thousands of years. Well, they measured it over 10 years and they saw massive changes. So I'm not sure why they're all saying this, these statements. Heat carried and slowly moving groundwater systems is contributing to the decay of submerged permafrost, creating large sinkholes in some areas and ice field hills called pingos in other areas. You know, water filled cavities have replaced the excess ice. So if you have a lot of permaf ice in the permafrost, when the ice melts, of course, you get the sinkholes, you get the collapses, you can get retrogressive thaw slumps, et cetera. You know, and the pingos can be formed when the brackish water produced by the permafrost decay migrates upwards and freezes, blistering the seafloor with ice-covered mounds. The temperature of the groundwater is unknown, probably a few degrees above melting. If it was 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit or 1 degree Celsius above freezing, it would melt an ice column over thousands of years. Um, anyway, changes uh, described in this, you know, what's what's really surprising about this study is how quickly these changes are occurring okay so let's have a look uh i talked about side scan sonar i talked about the rovs i talked about the okay um i talked about the beaufort sea a couple other things these are the siberian uh Sink, these are the Siberian explosive holes, the sinkholes. So just to remind you, uh, you know, look at this massive sinkhole. It's one of the largest that have appeared so far. This was August 2020 paper, uh, methane uh, blowholes. Okay, so just telling, you know, here's one in the winter, big crater. They measured high levels of methane down below, etc., Okay, so I've talked about these things in the past. Um, Yamal Peninsula, the Gaida Peninsula, seen lots of them appearing up in there. All we need is, we need Putin to go on a hike up in this region. Okay, very few people have witnessed explosions, but people who live up there say that they've seen uh, reindeer herders who witnessed a massive explosion of a mound on a river channel in the Yamal peninsula in 2017 okay and so on so these are these blowholes are appearing more and more frequently up in this region of siberia on land um and this is a more recent article for about about a year ago uh, mysteries unlocked by scientists so methane gas, powerful blowouts, methane gas blows ice and rock hundreds of feet away, leaves a gaping circular scar in the empty and airy, airy landscape. It was the 17th hole to appear in the Yamal and Gaida peninsulas in the Russian Arctic since it was first spotted in 2013. Okay, so there's some people standing around the edge. So massive, massive things. So this is from the warming of the permafrost more and more images and they've sent people people have gone down and measured high methane levels the, the pingo on land these are the sort of things with the pingos and you can get an ice wedge um, there can be hydrostatic pingos so water pressure fills up underneath causing the land to rise in the you know sort of uh, conical type uh, structure or you can have ice 
forming here, expanding, forming the hill to occur. So hydraulic pingos and hydrostatic pingos, okay, uh, can form. And here's some examples of them. Uh, here, there's ice in the core here. Uh, melting pingos, when the ice uh, melts, these things can then collapse, right? And form, if they form a depression, they can fill with water and be a thermokarst lake, and then the water can drain out. So you get all of these features on the land. So I looked, if you just Google PNAS, Beaufort Sea Holes, Arctic Seafloor, you can get the um, paper. And I'll talk about that paper. Um, also, this type of phenomena, retrogressive thaw slumps, are occurring also on the seafloor as have been determined. So here's one on land, a massive one on land. So the permafrost is thawing. It's no longer structurally strong. So the whole cliff face um, collapses and this it's retrogressive. So the cliff face moves back and back and back. So here's some examples here. Um, you know, here's here's a crater and, uh, you know, there's lots of examples of these retrogressive thaw slumps. Okay, so find the paper, the PNAS paper. Um, it was just, um, it just came online on Monday, March 14th, 2022. So hot off the press. So they did, uh, so I'll talk about some of the details I've talked about some of the overview, but let's have a look at the actual data. So high resolution bathymetric surveys using the side scan sonar of the shelf edge of the Canadian Beaufort Sea during a two to nine year long survey intervals. Okay, so they would repeat between two and nine, you know, they went from 2010 to 2019 anyway, and they did it multiple times. Coverage area was different, but they looked at the overlap. They found new steep-sided depressions up to 28 meter in depth, developing over that time frame, nine years, a lateral retreat along scarp faces. Okay, so as the hole was formed, it was very steep-sided, and then there'd be collapses and it would be slumping. So the depth could have even been deeper when it was originally formed, and then some of the cliff face fell in to, to fill in the hole. So it could have been even deeper than 28 meters. These morphological changes, um, to topographical bathymetric changes, they appeared between the 120 meter and 150 meter water depth region. Okay, now, so at the uh, peak of the last ice age, 21,000 years ago was the coldest, Sea levels were 125 to 130 meters deep. Okay, so these are the permafrost regions that would have been right at the edge. They would have been the coastal regions back then. Okay, so the permafrost, you would expect it to be the least thick there. Uh, you know, as you go to shallow and, and shallower water, that would have been exposed above sea level for much longer periods of time. So the permafrost could establish much deeper, actually up to about 600 meters in thickness. Um, so this, uh, you know, what's presently 120 to 150 meters deep right now is near the maximum limit of the submerged glacial age permafrost. And there are, these structures are attributed to permafrost thawing where ascending groundwater, rising groundwater is concentrated along the permafrost boundary. And then it's, uh, it thaws the permafrost and it causes the slump or it uh, freezes into ice wedges and then causes the pingo-like features. Okay, so, so we get these ice cord topographic highs or pingo-like features that are adjacent to the areas where the slumping occurred and where the, the, the sinkholes occurred, if you like. Okay, so we, you know, and if you read the details, okay, so lots of papers are written about what happens on land, right? Terrestrial permafrost degradation, right? You take sequential images of Arctic landscapes and you see the geomorphic changes attributed primarily to thermokarst activity. So this is, you get a slump, fills with water, you get a thermokarst lake. Um, and then the water can drain and so on. Okay, so we get all these new features 
appearing in the Arctic due to uh, climate system, abrupt climate system change, warming. Okay, the huge warming up in the Arctic. But the existence of extensive su relic submarine permafrost on the continental shelves in the Arctic has been known for years, but the dynamics of submarine underwater permafrost growth and decay and consequent modifications of seafloor morphology or topography are largely unexplored. Okay, so again, the key thing is that the the sea level was 125 meters lower at the peak of the last ice age. So this land, this um, what was what is seafloor now was above above uh, sea level. So it would be exposed to very cold air temperatures when it was exposed to temperatures, mean annual air temperatures, uh, less than minus 15 Celsius, then you'd get extensive permafrost forming during that those low sea level times. And then as the glaciers melted and sea level rose, it covered them up, and but it, they're still there. So the depth of the permafrost is greater than 600 meters below sea floor um, in, near the coastline. It forms a seaward thinning wedge beneath the outer shelf, okay? So let's have a look at the diagrams because, um, and then we can get these conical hills or pingo-like features. So pingos are common in the Arctic on the land, uh, but we're getting these pingo-like features also in the ocean. Okay, so let's have a look at the at the figures. So, so this is the um, there's Alaska, there's the Yukon, there's the Beaufort Sea. This is the permafrost. Uh, so the thickness of the permafrost set up to 600 meters thick here. So the blue, this is continuous permafrost. It's there all the time. Discontinuous in some regions. There's permafrost in other regions. There's not low or little or no permafrost. So those are the contour lines showing the thickness of the permafrost. And this is a 120 meter depth line as of today. So this would all be open land at the peak of the last ice age when the sea level was 125 meters lower. So all of this region could freeze, you could get the permafrost forming. And then when the ocean came back up with the melting of the glaciers. It covered this with water. This area here, these areas here were exposed to the air for much longer periods of time. So the permafrost could develop and be much deeper. These ones here uh, were, were along, you know, as soon as sea level started rising, it started covering these regions. So there wasn't as much time for the permafrost thickness to, to form. So here's a cross section of the permafrost. These are the isotherms, as you go down into depth below sea level, um, you know, the temperature, this is geothermal heat. And there's a region here, um, you know, this is the colder temperatures above. And, uh, you know, if you take a little cross section here, you can see, okay, so you've got a, thaw a thawed permafrost region here. And this is the, uh, you know, this area is kind of exposed, the seafloor is exposed there. So basically, okay, so that's uh, this this area here is across is shown here and then this area here is focused on. Okay, so and this is a methane hydrate stability zone, you know, these dashed lines here and here. Okay, so this is the uh, surveys at different times. Okay, so this is the extent of the survey, the 2010 survey, and the 2013 survey was a smaller region, the 2017 survey was this region. Okay, and then there was a 2019 survey, which was more extensive again. Okay, covering, you know, it looks like it's overlapping the 2010 uh, survey. They had a tripod here where they measured uh, the water temperature just above the surf, above the bottom, the ROV movements here, and they did also some coring. 
to see how thick the permafrost was. And these are areas of change. So from 2010 to 2019, these are all of the little sinkholes and pingos that are forming. So all of these things changed in this small gap of less than a decade. So this is, you know, and this is permafrost features which normally take much, much longer to change. Okay, um, and they show some of the, uh, some other data here on the permafrost characteristics. But again, you can see these regions where there was massive change from 2010 to 2019. You could also see some change from 2010 to 2013. You know, you can see uh, the, the purple here is changes from 2013 to 2017. 2017 to 2019, the black regions, and then the whole time frame is the red region. So you can see the water depth here. You know, this is 140 meter, this is 120 meter line. This is 140 meter, 150, <coughs> excuse me, will be somewhere up here. Okay, so it's all on the fringes of, it, basically it was the coastlines um, of um, at, during the peak of the last ice age with the sea level 125 meters lower. Okay, and then these are the little hills here from the Pingos. And, uh, you know, a lot of the depressions occurred in this region. Let's look at some more. So this is, uh, this is a couple different regions. So this is in 2010. This is in 2019. So look at this. This is the water depth, 157 meters, 130 meters. So look at this, this whole region here, right? It was very, very shallow and became very, very deep, you know, in the space of the nine years. This is a change. If you take this minus this, this is what we have. And you can do a cross section here. So this is a 2010 survey. Okay. And this is a 2019 survey. So massive depression formed in this time period. And this is, uh, uh, you know, they, they looked at some, a bunch of different regions, and this is the change in water depth between, uh, let's have a look here. This is between, uh, this is a 2017 survey. I believe it compares it to the 2013 survey. And you can see these different regions you know, uh, figure 4A, B, C, etc. So there were different samples taken. And these are the images here of the changes. Okay, so this is the changes. Um, so it uh, looks like a pingo here, a big depression here, a big depression here. So, you know, very, very rapid changes over short periods of time. Okay, so... Basically, and then they try to analyze, you know, what's causing it and so on. And this is the first study, first preliminary study on it. Um, not, I mean, but it's done, it's taken, it's taken uh, about 10 years of data, nine years of data. Um, and the, they, uh, the density of these submarine pingos, 19.6 per square kilometer, based on 550 pingos within the 28 kilometer squared area mapped in 2019. This is higher than the pingo density known elsewhere. So there's numerous pingos along the shelf slope transition, you know, around between that 120 to 140 meter water depth. Okay, so also depressions and they're happening very very rapidly so this is only a very over a very limited area of the arctic you know we'll go back this is the beaufort sea area okay so there's no reason to uh think there's anything unique about this region so surveys need to be done around the entire arctic between that 120 and 140 or 150 meter water depth, 
or you know you can i mean you can take the number of changes in this region and extrapolate around the arctic and you get horrifying numbers for the way that the bathymetry is changing and uh you know what can it be but abrupt rapid climate system change although they're not saying that specifically here but there's no other explanation in my opinion also in antarctica you know the that range of water depth between 120 and 150 meters needs to be examined because you know when sea level was lower right we can sort of see those sort of effects also happening on the antarctica coastlines and in fact on any island okay around the planet you know especially in the northern and some southern hemisphere at high latitudes you know where the water temperatures are low air temperatures are low oceans are cold there you know there's no reason to uh, suspect that this is not a global phenomena covering those um, bathymetry ranges so uh, i highly recommend that you you know have a look at this article here and then if you want to delve into more details you know google pnas beaufort sea holes arctic sea floor and have a look at this paper, which was just published hot off the press. And, uh, you know, you can see that, you know, there's massive changes on the seafloor as a result of abrupt climate system change. It's not just the obvious in your face visible ones that we see on the land, but these, these uh, features are also happening under the ocean and more uh you know this needs to be looked at very carefully in terms of the uh you know thawing permafrost releasing methane and co2 which could go up through the water column into the atmosphere and cause massive uh, changes in the greenhouse gas levels basically you know the earth this is a response of the earth to uh the, to what humanity has done with our greenhouse gas uh emission sledgehammer you know um anyway thank you for listening and uh until next time bye for now and yes uh please make sure you have a look at my blog paulbeckwith.net and uh consider donating to my PayPal account to support my research and analysis and videos as I join the dots on abrupt climate system change. Thanks again and bye for now.